However, happiness could not last. A few years later, Harriet's mistress died, and ownership was turned to her mistress's niece. But her niece was only a child, two to three years old, so the actual master of the 12-year-old was the father, Dr. James Northam. The Northam household was not perfect. The doctor's wife didn't trust her husband because he pursues other women, and soon began making advances towards Harriet. By the time she was 15, Dr. Northam began to harass her, whispering foul words in her ear, and a few times tried to sexually abuse her. For years, my master had done his utmost to pollute my mind with foul imagery and to destroy the pure principles inculcated by my grandmother and our good mistress in her childhood. She asked Dr. Northam for permission to marry a free black man, but he refused. Harriet thought that her master would leave her alone if she began having an affair with another man a white, unmarried lawyer named Samuel Sawyer. Harriet soon gave birth to a son, Joseph. In 1833, Harriet gave birth to another one of Sawyer's children, this time a baby girl whom she named Louisa. When my babe was born, they said it was premature. It weighed only four pounds, but God thought it eight. When they told me my newborn babe was a girl, my heart was heavier than it had ever been before. Slavery is terrible for men, but it is far more terrible for women. During her years of being a house slave in the Northam household, she heard her master say that when her children became of age, he would send them to work in his plantation field. One day, she put Louisa, who was ill, on a cart that carried shingles to town. The two-year-old stayed with her great-grandmother until she was healthy again. Dr. Norcom was so aggravated that he sent her to work in his plantation field. She had many failed attempts to escape. One night, she finally did and ran to her grandmother's house. For nearly seven years, she hid in a cramped attic waiting for the opportunity to secure her freedom. Finally, in June of 1835, Harriet Jacobs escaped to the north. Dr. Norcom was so angry, he offered an immense amount of money for Harriet to be captured. At the time, what he offered was worth a lot more than what it is worth today. In 1842, Harriet sailed to Philadelphia and reunited with her daughter. She soon became involved with the abolitionists associated with Frederick Douglass' paper, The North Star. Along with her kids, they lived in several towns and cities for 10 years before she was able to secure her freedom for herself and her two children in 1852. Not long after her freedom, Harriet begins to write about her experience as a slave. Some people believe that she began by writing anonymous letters to a New York newspaper. Later on, she begins to write her well-known book, Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl, published in 1861. Her book was one of the very few accounts of Southern slavery written by a woman. It has elements of disguise and elements from novels. One of the most popular examples of these is the way she used pseudonyms in order to protect the privacy of individuals, including herself. Her pen name was Linda Brent. Harriet Jacobs is much like Langston Hughes. Both black authors were great writers who first began writing to newspapers and eventually wrote texts that made history. Langston Hughes, born in 1902, wrote as many as 16 books of poems, two novels, three collections, and many more. He was a very prolific writer who lived a middle-class life but was under the influence of segregation. Even after her death in 1897, Harriet Jacobs' autobiography was thought to be one of the most phenomenal work. Even though some people do not believe that an ex-slave who was abused for years is able to write out something as extraordinary as it is, it offers a rare perspective on American slavery and the viewpoint of a woman. Today, it still remains one of the most fundamental texts on American slave history. <laughs>